For a couple other people to show up, and I'll introduce you then. Um, so Thanks. yeah, enjoy. I hope. Uh, where where are you uh, based? Uh, in India. Okay. Hello, Devanch. Uh, hi, Bradley. All right. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Yash in at when uh, everyone gets here. Devanch is, uh, I remember you from, we were talking on Slack. Uh, you're from the yes. Open League. Yes, yes, and I have classmates, actually. Oh, what is that? We are classmates, yes, and I. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so we do most of the stuff together, and I think it would be great if we could, like, join here as well. Okay. All right, I'll introduce you, as, as or you can introduce yourself. I'll just... Make some time at the beginning of the meeting. Hello, Vinay. Hey, Well, I'm doing all right. Hello? I don't think your audio is working. Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's like... Uh, is Susan going to join us today? I don't know. I sent the email. I'm not sure if she's going to show up or not. Oh, okay. Okay. Just one <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear back from her, but I sent her the email, so. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know who else is going to show up, but we I guess we can start now. Uh, so welcome to this week's meeting, and I hope everyone is uh, doing well. Uh we're going to have one more meeting this calendar year on this uh, topic, and it's going to cover hierarchical temporal modeling. And uh, you'll see what that is when I present it, I guess. <laughs> there are a couple other, also a couple other alternate uh, versions of what they're doing. So, like, there are different methods that we haven't talked about too much or at all. Um, things like dendritic trees and, and other methods. I mean, these are all methods for analyzing data, but. Um, you know, they're they're more brain inspired than the ones that we've been talking about. Uh, maybe save for reinforcement learning, but these are like you know rooted in like the brain anatomy itself. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, well, I'll talk about a specific topic: uh, invariance and universal features. So that's not really that clear on what that is yet, but when I get into the talk, you'll see what it is. Um, also, uh, we have two new people today, Devanch and Yash, and why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Okay, I'll go ahead. Okay. I am Devanch, I'm a third year undergrad uh, at Delhi, in Delhi. So, uh, I met Bradley a long time ago in Mozilla Open Leaders as a program, so that's why he told me about Debug Home and Open Home. Uh, and, uh, I am really interested in machine learning and deep learning. I have been doing some research in NLP lately and, I, and when I saw that Devil Worm ML was a group, I really wanted to be a part of it. That's why I joined. This is my classmate, he will introduce him himself now. So, I am Vita uh, Gagal. I am also a third year undergrad at Delhi, in Delhi. So I am also, just like Devansh, I am interested in you know, machine learning and computer vision things. Uh, 
uh, I got to know about open women develop open home uh, from the ones just a week ago, and I researched and I found it quite great. So I want to contribute in it here. Okay, well, thank you for showing up, and uh, you know, just today you can just sit back and if you're interested in talking, bring something up to next week, we can uh, do so. So this week, I, I'm going to do that talk, but I'm also going to do a, I'm going to profile a paper that was uh, sent by one of our colleagues that isn't here today, I don't, unless she shows up uh, on embryos, and we might talk about it more later, but I just wanted to point to it today. So uh, it, first of all, there, is there any uh, news or any of items of interest people want to bring up? Okay. Dick says, Yash and Devench, welcome. Please put your contact information in the chat. And so the chat is on your right. It's like a little uh, caption bubble. And you click that and you can go into the chat. Um, anything else? Okay. All right, there we go. There's an email. So I guess I can jump right into this. Uh, well, we'll see if anyone else shows up. But if they show up, I'll uh, take a break in the presentation and let them into the room here. So, uh, okay. So let me share my screen first. What was this? Uh, Vinay said. Uh, oh, okay. Vinay said just a little busy with uh, GCI now and some regular college. Good. That the GCI is the Google code in, correct? I should probably ask you how that's go, how you're finding that. Yeah, because this is like your first time doing this sort of thing. I, I mean, you know, it's they always have problems in these areas. So, in these uh, rooms, they're not perfect. So, okay. Why don't I share my screen? Um, okay. It's a very good experience. I'm surprised to see their commitment and knowledge at such a young age. Yeah, I find that too with, uh, well, I mean, you know, usually uh, when I taught, you know, when I've taught in university settings, you know, for undergraduates, I always enjoy like seeing how excited people are. Uh, if it's like a, ma if it's one of their major classes, uh, you do get like a pretty lively group of people we're ready to go and, and tackle some issues and, and really do things that you wouldn't think that they were not maybe up for. You know, I, I mean, I'm just making a blanket statement about that. But, you know, you you have a syllabus or you have expectations. And a lot of times you see them, uh, you know, exceeded. And I say major uh, classes because sometimes you get non-major classes. You get people who don't really want to be there or whatever. and They're just doing it for credit. But. You do, I mean, you know, and, and I think like with programs like the Google Summer Code or Code In, you get a lot of people who really want to be there doing that specific thing. And so you get a lot of, you know, it's really exciting. You can do a lot of things in that setting. Hello, Jesse. Hi. So that's good. Thanks for the update. Uh, why don't I share my screen now okay this is my first time doing professional mentoring overall i'm enjoying it and i learn learning a lot as well took some mentoring lessons from you thank you <laughs> thank you yeah it's good uh yeah it's very good uh I, I think it's you'll have to keep us updated on uh, the progress with what people are doing 
I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting things going on in that uh, experience. So, okay, let me share my screen here. All right. Okay. And we are. This going. Can you see my slides here? Okay. I mean, I can see the pre that I'm presenting. What is this message here in the chat? Okay. All right. So this is invariance and universal features. And it might not be clear what that is yet, but we will get into it. Um, it's going to be like a a combination of things and it's going to show basically the idea that you have this larger set of concepts surrounding you know what you might find what comes out of a machine learning algorithm so we do this to find classifications to find you know certain configurations of, of solution to a problem and that's all you know it does seem like magic to a lot of people but i submit to you that it's not really magic at all we actually can study sort of the basic science of these networks and understand a little bit more about what they do and why they do it. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is a concept called invariance. So in statistics and in, in geometry and in math and in physics and a lot of other areas that are quantitative, there's this notion called invariance. And that has to do with the property of a system which remains unchanged after some transformation. So there's some examples of invariance in these figures. Um, and I would uh, draw your attention to this reference down here. Uh, Eugene Wigner, who is a mid-20th century uh, scientist engineer, he, had, he was kind of like a peripheral cybernetics person. He published this paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. And his argument was is that mathematics is very effective at approximating the natural world or the physical world. He kind of focused on physics and chemistry, but uh, the idea was that you can use math to describe these worlds and, and their behavior of things. So you can come up with a theory like, you know, general and uh, specific relativity. You can come up with uh, geometric laws that hold under a number of conditions. and it's a very powerful technique, and that was his argument. And so what separates maybe like physics and chemistry and math from like maybe the social sciences or the biological sciences in some cases is this effectiveness in mathematics. Is it, you know, how effective is it to write an equation or a series of equations and come out with answers that are predictive? And so invariance is that part of the answer that is sort of the structure or the core structure of the thing that you're looking at in that world, whether they be brains or trajectories in space or, you know, something else. The invariance is that part of the answer that is the thing you can latch on to to sort of characterize the behavior of the system. So, you know, like orbits are, you know, they're not deterministic necessarily, but they have things like periodicity and other properties that are uh, you know, that are regular and you can predict them. So I'm going to talk about two papers in the literature, start off with two papers. Uh, they both involve Hod Lipson, who's a, a, he actually does evolutionary robotics at Cornell and he publishes actually in a number of areas. Uh, one, one paper that they published in 2014, which has actually been quite popular since, is the, uh, the, it's called How Transferable Are Features in Deep Neural Networks. Um, and then there's another paper that they published, a different collaborator on this, uh, Distilling Freeform Natural Laws from Experimental Data. And so I'll talk about the first paper and then I'll talk about the second paper. So in terms of the first paper, uh, they, they ask a question, how transferable are features within a network? And so what does that mean? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, consider a deep neural network that trains on a set of natural images. So in this network, we have a number of layers, hidden layers, 
that process the information. And the idea is how transferable are features from one layer to another layer. So as we go through the layers, do they all represent the, da uh, the data in a similar way? Are they all blind or what are they doing? And as it turns out, you find that the first layers of these deep networks learn general features such as color blobs or Gabor filters. And what's interesting about this finding is that it's very similar to what the human brain does in terms of its anatomy. So the human brain has an area called V1, which is the beginning of like the visual processing in the brain itself. Uh, there are a couple steps in the uh, path between the eye and the brain, but in the brain there's V1 and that that's uh, very similar to what we find in this first layer of networks. Uh, you know, you find these color blobs, you find these uh, stripes and things like that. And then they're put together later on in the visual system and described as, as images by your brain. But they all start out in these very simple shapes and, and patterns. Um, so, But this first layer is actually general to many data sets and tasks. So they're features that, uh, you know, aren't really like, uh, you know, shapes or like they're not defined shapes that you can identify with a name like a car or a horse. But they're things that are maybe important building blocks for these features, or they're things that are going to appear in, you know, as motifs in these features that are repeated. So this first layer is very general. But then as you progress down the network, layer by layer, you start to get more specific. And as you go down, you get more task-specific information. And that's where those attributes are learned down further in the network. And so this is a visual of what I'm talking about here. Uh, there's this paper, New Theory Cracks Open the Black Box of Deep Learning. It's a, actually a Quanta article. And that's where I got this figure, which shows that you have this input, and it's an uh, image that we have a name for called a dog. And it's very unambiguous. And you plug it into the network as an image with pixels, and you take it apart pixel by pixel. And in layer one, it's very simple. You're identifying pit single pixels and you're finding like, you know, uh, you know, color gradients, uh, you know, intensities, things like that. Very simple, uh, features. Then you go down into the network, you know, through layer two, layer three, and so forth. And you start to get more complex features. So you take the features from layer one, you combine them in at layer two, you combine the features at layer two and layer three and so on. And then you get an output, which correctly I classifies dog. But this isn't magic. It's just taking these very simple building blocks and adding them together and getting to something that the algorithm can approximate as a dog. Now, if it's something that it's not, that's really an outlier, like if it were a dog with like six legs or eight legs, you know, say it had a, some mutation or had horns, then it wouldn't necessarily do as well in terms of identifying it, because it couldn't put together the right set of features. It would be confused at some point, and it would output something that was below threshold or ambiguous. So this general to specific transition, just remember that these first layers are highly general. Uh, you know, it, you classify things that are very simple, like stripes or dots or something that's very you know, uh, we have a name for them maybe, but they're not really related to the input directly. Uh, then the next layers are more specific and they create context specific features like uh, ears or a tail uh, in the case of the dog here. Uh, this, this image here is just a reminder of what I meant by when I said V1. Uh, this is V1 here. This is your, this is uh, your eyes are here and there's a pathway through the brain that isn't like, you know, it doesn't do a lot of processing except for at the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then the information goes to almost directly to this V1. And the V1, of course, is where you get a lot of these blobs and, and stripes and things like that. Uh, and we actually, at my other meeting Saturday, we talked about uh, how people can take fMRI images of the brain and they can take V1 and image it using... Uh, neuroimaging techniques and actually reconstruct images that are being represented or passed through V1. It was actually quite an interesting uh, 
observation. Someone saw it in a talk and we talked about it, but there are people who are doing this where they're able to take the information in V1, these very simple features, and predict, forward predict the image. So the information is in there, but it's not represented in the same way. It's represented as a bunch of blobs. And then as you go through the brain, there are two pathways called the what and the where pathway. And they deal with different aspects of objects, more sophisticated aspects of objects like context or larger, more complex features. And then eventually you see of the natural world, very complex natural scenes. So there is an analogy to the brain I wanted to point to here. This is why I brought it up. Um, we'll talk about maybe a little bit more about it later. Um, and then this is a graph about the transferability of features. So there's transferability of features as well, from the very simple features of stripes and dots to very complex features that, you know, maybe you have to really put together in a number of different ways from those simpler features and classify them. Uh, this is also called transfer learning, if you know that area of the literature. If not, this is there's a whole literature on this, um, and it can provide a boost to generalization. So it can um, it can really help you in terms of your. That's this is why more layers tend to be better. We we had this discussion. I can't remember. It may have been last summer about the number of layers in deep learning and why that's so powerful. And there, there are some caveats to that, but it's it's generally powerful to have more layers. Uh, and this is a an article here, a survey of transfer learning in the Journal of Big Data. And this is a survey of this area. Uh, I'll make these slides available um, after the talk, so don't worry about getting too much information out of this. Um, and then there's another paper that I wanted to highlight that's kind of related to the second paper or the first paper that I talked about uh, before I move on to the second paper. This one is deep learners benefit more from other distribution examples. And in this case, we're talking about now images and, and features as being in distributions, statistical distributions. So in this paper, they observe much of what the other authors observe, that there's a hierarchy of multiple levels in deep learning networks. You, and they're and they're based on visual the visual pathways in neocortex, so V1, V2, and these higher order centers. So the deeper you go into a network, the more complicated the processing and the more higher order it is. Um, you you can also build general distributions of related examples. Uh, so you can build distributions from what's being analyzed in the in the uh, in the input, but you can also build upon that with this sort of hierarchical structure. In other words, you can take features and you can put them together and you can put together things that are, you know, sort of generally descriptive, but also, you know, give the network a little bit more power in terms of the different instances, the different variations that you might see in, in the world. And there's also a trade-off between task specificity and statistical prediction. So, uh, if you want to be very specific about what you're identifying, uh, you know, if, if it's like just one, there's no variation in your input data, uh, your statistical prediction will suffer using a large deep network like this. And so they point to these things, uh, and that's, that's that paper if you're interested in looking at it. It's just an example of the sort of distributional view. Um, there are also, there's also another paper, uh, Sparse Deep Belief Net Models for Visual Area V2. And this is actually a paper that has authors, including at, uh, Andrew Eng, who's a uh, very prominent machine learning educator. And in this paper, all I'll mention about that is that the point of that paper is you can build high-performing algorithms that are built from architectures inspired by bio-inspired um, bio uh, architecture. So the architecture of V2 in particular is something that they point to and they can draw from and actually, uh, you know, approximate fairly well. So this, we'll move back to the second paper that I mentioned from um, Hoplipson, and that has to do with the documentation of analytical laws. So I talked about deep learning as just an example, but if we want to broaden it out a little bit to different types of
like neural networks and, and automated machine learning. This is what they do in this paper. So they're interested in documenting what they call analytical laws. And so remember I talked about the uh, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Well, that unreasonable effectiveness comes from taking physical phenomena like this pendulum, collecting data about its motion, about its the position of the pendulum and the movement, the velocity and all that, then using numerical methods to calculate derivatives for these variables, putting plugging them into equations, and then finding what they call candidate equations to describe the motion. I mean, we have equations of motion, and they go all the way back to Newton, but th there may be better equations that describe it better. I mean, we don't really know that. All we know is that Newton gave us these equations of motion. They work pretty well. Um, not everything Newton said was like, you know, the absolute best way to do it because we have, you know, relativity, for example. Uh, but, you know, I guess they ask the question here, are these the absolute best laws that we can have? And so they run through these candidate equations just by mining these data from, from a pendulum. Uh, and then they come up, try to come up with an answer. So they can identify important correlations using algorithms. They can also discover things like harmonic oscillators and chaotic double pendula. So when you have a single pendulum, it's pretty simple. You know, the, the laws there are pretty simple. When you have coupled pendula, like two pendula moving together, or two pendula that have chaotic motion, then it's a lot harder to describe those. And so basically you can take simple you know simple rules you can discover those and then use those to bootstrap the discovery of more complex laws and i put a bunch of figures in here that you probably can't read very well but uh these are some of their results uh you know they're, they're trying to basically predict uh you know the data from a series of hypotheses which are phrased as equations and those equations then are evaluated and they're able to distill what they call laws out of these data. So, I mean, we're basically doing the same thing we're doing in deep learning with classification, except in this case, we're trying to build laws that are generalizable in the form of equations. Uh, then we actually, let me stop here. I want to look and see if we have any comments. I think we have a couple. Okay, so we had, uh, how was that envision? Jesse said, yes, he's a, he's, he's a very interesting guy. You should read his, some of his work. Oh, here's Ojoa. Good, good timing. Hi, Ojoa. Uh, and Dick made a comment. In biological vision, the input image is not broken into pixels. No, it's broken into, well, we don't really know what it's broken into, but it kind of, you get these, like stripes and opponent color schemes and, and, and dots. So it's not broken into pixels. This, when I meant in biological vision, you know, it's broken into those things, but in computer vision, it's broken into pixels. And actually, it's not even broken into pixels all the time. Sometimes you can use like regions and find like common themes in that. So I, let's see, he gave a, a uh, reference here. Gordon and Hirsch, vision begins with direct reconstruction of the retinal image, how the brain sees and stores pictures. And so this reference is good if you want to know more. Uh, can you say more about what biological vision is broken into? I know that's a tangent. Receptive fields, yeah. So it's receptive fields. Uh, like there, So you have like different areas of the, of the uh, natural image that you're extracting with your retina, and it's pulling those together in the brain and interpreting what those are so like your one eye if you close one eye and you look at the, your computer screen you know you'll see like an image and then you close the other eye, you know, close the other eye and you look through the other eye and you see the same image but it's a little bit offset um so you're actually seeing two different views of the same thing it's just because your eyes are aligned towards the front of your head that you're able to see them in a unified manner if you were like a, a horse you would see one side of the world and the other side of the world through each eye. So then those that stuff is integrated in the brain. I didn't want to go too far into how the brain processes um, 
information because there's a lot of information about that online. Receptive fields are circular and elongated and overlap, yeah. So, I mean, let me, let me get back to the talk. Um, just keep putting comments in there if you want. Um, so, then I have another, I'm kind of going off in all these examples, but it's important to see because there's a lot of stuff out there, and I tried to bring it down into, like, the, you know, more most interesting stuff. So uh, there's a paper called Tensor Programs 1, Wide Feed Forward or Recurrent Neural Networks of Any Architecture or Gaussian Processes. And in this paper, they make the point that all recurrent neural networks with random weights, whether they be deep learning or perceptrons or regular neural networks, they're basically Gaussian processes. So these are random weights that aren't specifically uh, biased towards anything. So those are all Gaussian processes. And people don't think about it too much, but that's basically what they are. Uh, this is an intuitive guide to Gaussian processes. That's where I got this figure. And this figure shows the difference between different aspects of Gaussian processes. So <clears throat> in some cases, you have data that are, so you have a Gaussian process and you enter data that have a pattern in it. And the Gaussian process is sort of weighted by that data. So like the Gaussian process is maybe what you might consider to be random. Uh, and you put data in, and it gives you a directionality to that. So think about this one on the right is noisy data, right? Or it's noise, and it could just be like Gaussian process outputting stuff. And you don't know if that there's no pattern in that necessarily. Um, the difference is, is when you get regimes like this, where you have periodic outputs or strong linear trends in your output. And these two examples on the left are examples of structure in the data. So a uh, pure Gaussian process doesn't necessarily have, well, it has structure. It has like this uh, variation around the mean. But in terms of like, you know, features really doesn't have anything that's, you know, you can really identify consistently across instances of Gaussian processes. Um, but you can also use Gaussian processes to improve, you know, your data, uh, your data analysis uh, by contrasting the Gaussian process with the da input data. So there are a lot of ways that Gaussian processes are useful in networks like this. Uh, in this case, they're using uh, Gaussian processes to sort of uh, improve the data or to boost the data. Um, and so there are a couple of uh, caveats that they give. that Gaussian processes are computationally expensive. It does allow us to incorporate expert knowledge in a network. And then the definition of Gaussian distributions are probability distributions over possible functions. So I just wanted to point, your, point you out to that work. Um, and then we have a paper by Max Tegmark and colleagues. Max Tegmark is a physicist who does a lot of different topics on, uh, you know, and one of his interests is this idea of deep and cheap learning. So deep learning is, uh, of course, we know what that is, but cheap learning is actually something that allows us to maybe make more use of these deep learning networks. So, yeah, they ask a question in this paper, uh, how can neural networks function well in practice? Uh, but if you like look at your uh, possible functions that you might want to use, it's exponentially larger than the set of probable networks. So in other words, what they're saying is that neural networks work very well, but they're maybe if you think about how they're set up, they're sort of improbable to work. It's improbable that they actually work. Like uh, you, if you want to solve it, say using a brute force method, you wanted to solve a similar problem using a brute force method, it might be almost impossible to do. And so why do they work so well if you just put that in and they just give you an answer? Uh, and one of the ways that they test, they looked at this was through this uh, lens of cheap learning. And so cheap learning is defined as networks with many fewer parameters than regular deep learning networks. So cheap learning is basically just stripping everything out of like a typical deep learning network and just using a couple of parameters. Um, and 
they're able, using this method and other methods, they're able to observe physical principles in deep learning networks, including symmetry, locality, compositionality, and polynomial log probability. So they look at these deep learning networks sort of as, you know, what are they doing in terms of computation? And then they use this cheap learning method to sort of get a handle on it, uh, just to see what the thing is, what's going on inside of it. And they find that they actually, uh, there are a number of physical principles that are going on in terms of the computation. Uh, they also propose something called no flattening theorems, which are efficient, efficient linear deep nets cannot be approximated by shallow ones without efficiency loss. So if you have a deep network and it's linear and it's efficient, you can't like compact that down into a shallow network. And so, um, I mean, that's, that's, you can read more about that in that paper, but this is an example of where you're doing this sort of basic science on the deep learning networks and trying to figure out the, the underlying principles. Um, and then there's an area of mathematical regularities as metaphor. So there's a blog post that I'm drawing from here that is a, it's actually a video and it lays out the video in the blog post. Uh, and this goes more towards categorization. So we've been talking about like some pretty hefty sort of physical computation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about mathematical regularities in terms of categorization. So, you know, how do we categorize things using innate mechanisms? Um, it turns out we find the essence of things and we break them down into prototypical or less prototypical categories. So we have birds here, two birds. One is a, ch a rooster or chicken and the other is a, a bird that isn't. And this is your, if this is your prototype bird, this would be your less prototypical bird. But we still classify these both as birds. And so, you know, you have to have like, it turns out that you have to be able to have a whole system of classification to do that. You can't just throw things into bins randomly, nor can you just use like, you know, a couple of features that are, you know, work well. There's actually a whole uh, structure to this. And Saunders McLean, who was the founder of category theory, proposed two means of this. So one, one is disentangling, which is the process of settling on categories by picking properties that matter. Well, we know that in machine learning because we know that like some data sets work better than others and it's because of the feature space is better. But we also have something called metaphors. And so metaphors are linking by analogy, grounding in concrete activity, an extraneous, extraneous uh, reasoning. So, like maybe X is like Y in some way. And so, if we ask those, if we do those three things, we can build metaphors, and that will actually help us um, analyze, you know, find better categories that are more inclusive, deal with uh, variation better. I'm just bringing this up so that you're aware that this is, this is actually more like traditional AI research. But it's definitely, I think, relevant to machine learning and deep learning. Um, and then we have, we go from that, we can go to what we call universality. And so in this case, we have, uh, this is a blog post, Cellular Automata, the Atoms of Complexity. Um, and in this article, they talk about uh, how you get these, this natural pattern formation. So we're in, in, and of course, this is something that Dick talks about a lot. Uh, this is morphogenesis of skin on a, on a, on an amphibian. And we have these different patterns that form. And there are a number of theories as to why this is the case. And Dick can probably tell you more if you want to know. Um, but it seems that this is a universal pattern of, pattern, or universal sort of feature of pattern formation. And we know this maybe because we can take these types of patterns and replicate them using a cellular automata, which is a, a computational tool that is uh, actually, if you run these simu type of simulations and you analyze them, you get specific rules that are numbered. And the rules have different like input variables. You don't use actual data for these um, cellular automata. You just use like a certain set of rules of interaction in between cells. And they, you end up with these patterns that approximate things you see in the natural world. But they also have rules that are very specific and are universal. 
And so uh, Stephen Wolfram wrote about this. He's actually devoted his entire career to this. Uh, he talks about universal, universality and complexity in cellular automata. And his argument is that all one-dimensional automata, which are like these like strings of cells, they've you can run these very simple simulations and you can get four classes of computation. You can get something called limit points, limit cycles, chaotic attractors, and universal computation. So I've given an a image of each one here, and they basically describe ways of describing complex systems, ways of describing outputs of data. But there's a regularity here. We have things that we can identify. They're not rules per se, but they're patterns of of things in the output. So like in a chaotic attractor, we have two attractor points in the system goes between those two points. Uh, we have limit cycles where if we build a an attractor of some complex system, we get different types of like cycles that occur. And then if we plot our data out on a bivariate graph, we get these limit points where the parameter goes to a certain value and then comes back and then goes back like this. So there's there are limit points that define sort of you know features of the, the function and the behavior of the system dynamically. And so we get these types of things from these very simple automata. And the automata are arguably networks. They're just series of cells that are aligned and they interact and then they produce these types of outputs. They're very ordered. They have like you know uh, some sort of regularity to them. So I'm going to finish off and talk a little bit. Actually, let me go to the comment. Okay. Uh, this. Oh, this. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to finish up with this talking about a theory of data, and this is a something a little bit different than what we've been talking about. We've been talking about like deep learning networks and, and cellular automata and all these things that are very comp hard to get your head around, except for the, the categorization stuff. Uh, but this is a little bit different. So Clyde H. Coombs was actually a, a, a psychologist. He was a, he worked in an area called psychophysics. And psychophysics is unique because it's, it's an area where they have you know different types of experiments and they set them up so that they have they can extract laws from these experiments so they have uh things called, like fitz law or they have like uh, the weber fechner law and these are laws of perception so it's like if i present a task like moving a cup across the table or viewing a bunch of points and estimating how many points there are you can do this uh pretty easily but if the, the trick is, is if I change the number of dots or if I change the difficulty of movement, you do the task at different parameter values and you end up with this sort of scaling or this regularity in the data that is a law. And so it's law-like. And so he proposes a theory of data that is focused on psychophysics. And I use this in another talk to illustrate sort of the bridge between like these regularities and data and theory. So he introduced this thing called the theory of data. It's back from the 1960s. Um, and it's, there are methods for collecting and analyzing data in this theory. But the important thing is he introduced this idea of content oriented models. And so content oriented models have a couple of features. And uh, one is that they can be cast in mathematical form as miniature behavior theories. So I told you that you have something like Fitz law or the Weber Fechner law, those are very specific to different types of sets of experiments, different uh, psychophysical properties. So, you know, if you, you can't apply, say, Weber Fechner law to uh, moving a cup across the table, that's Fitz law. That's a separate law from Weber Fechner. But if you have these different uh, laws, they sort of, uh, you know, span the entirety of behavioral regularities. So uh, each of these mathematical laws sort of is a behavioral theory for a certain specific area of behavior. Uh, they have broader applicability, though, these content-oriented models. They could be applied maybe perhaps to machine learning, but we don't really know. We don't, the people haven't really explored this area.
and it allows you to formulate alternative theories and hypotheses. Looks like Dick wants to come back in. Okay. Okay. Oh, and the le okay. He had a comment. Last curve is just like a hysteresis curve. I assume you mean from the the slide back uh, a couple slides ago. Yeah, from the one that I was showing about universality. Yeah, so this limit points was a hysteresis curve. Yeah, it is, and um, I don't know if this, that's what they're looking at here. I just kind of grabbed this uh, figure, but it illustrates limit points. Um, but anyways, it, it, Clyde Coombs pro, pro, uh, proposed this, these content-oriented models. And so this is an example of how this works in the context of psychophysics. So Fechner's law, which I talked about, the, the idea is you have to you give someone an array of dots, and you have to find the noticeable difference between two sets of visual arrays. So as you can see, you compare like these two arrays, ten dots versus twenty dots, and then you have them compare one hundred and ten dots versus one hundred and twenty dots. So the idea is if you can de detect the difference between ten dots and twenty dots, then you've detected a difference. If you can't, then you know, it's below your threshold for detecting differences. You're taking the entirety of the dots and evaluating whether there's a difference. And you can do this for, you know, the 10 to 110 and 20 to 120. And obviously, if you compare those two sets, you're going to find a difference. It's obvious. But this, this whole ability across different magnitudes can be described by a physical law. And this physical law is mathematical, and it's actually pretty simple. And so you can use this equation to describe this aspect of perceptual data. And that's a just noticeable difference. So, you know, if you, if I ask, if I give you two arrays and ask you to define between 10 and 11 dots, you probably won't be able to do it. But 10 and 110 dots, sure, no problem. But that whole regime can be described in this equation. So in a theor theory of data, the theoretical model should bring us closer to recovering the true phenomenological space. And this is true if the phenomena are law-like, so that they follow a set of regularities. So maybe, you know, if I ask you to interpret literature, I couldn't build a law out of that necessarily. But I can build a law out of these things in psychophysics. Uh, but then also if the data provide a direct or inferential window to a phenomenon. And I think that's true of like anything in, that we do in deep learning and machine learning is that you have to have a direct window to the phenomenon. If it's like something that's not related to some phenomenon, you know, it makes it harder to actually do your analysis. Um, the, the underlying structure of the problem is key. And so theories can also create sense-making models of the world. So if you put a bunch of data into this magic machine, you end up with a classification scheme. Do theories dream or create or dream of electric sheep? So do they actually form a meaningful classification or pattern? Maybe, but they also have to have a, a definable pattern going into the machine. So this is what this is. You can see the what I've done here is I've taken a bunch of seemingly random binary values, and there's a structure of a sheep there we didn't know existed. It goes into this machine, and it gets classified as a sheep, but the structure was always there. It's not like the algorithm is creating structure. The structure has to be there to begin with. So I'm going to talk about one more thing before we end here, and that is a blog post called Data Driven Science is a Failure of Imagination. And this gets, this actually just talks about Bayesian models and, you know, some of the interpret interpretable things that we can learn from those. Um, so Bayesian models are conditional probabilistic statements uh, based on generalized hypotheses, so it's basically the probability of theory given the data. Uh, it's consistent with a theoretical but naive view of the world, and more data make it harder to test simple theories in this case. So we use a basic, in general, if you add data, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to test simple theories. It makes it harder because you have out, you know, outcomes that are divergent sometimes. And so having sort of a, a theoretical basis for you know, figuring out how these things work in data are important. Um, and so in this blog post, he gives an example of linear regression outputs. Uh, so in this case, you have uh, 
a sample size, an effect, which is a positive test, and then support from the theoretical model. So you have these different outcomes. You have low end, strong effect, strong support. Your theory is this red line here. And the, and the data match the theory because they all line up along the line. In this case, you have more, a larger N, and it still supports the theory of the red line because it's clustered along the red line. There's a little bit more variation, but it's consistent. In this case, you have low N, but you have no support for this red line hypothesis. Uh, they're scattered all over the place. That's also because there's no structure in the data, inherent structure in the data. Uh, and in this case, you have a larger n, but you still have weak, a weak effect, which is that it's not linear, but strong support for this alternate red line hypothesis, which is here. So the idea here is that you have hypotheses, which are kind of like mini theories. You can apply them to data, and there are a couple of parameters that we want to use to sort of figure out whether something is a real signal or if it has real structure or not. It's not as simple as just, you know, putting data into a machine learning algorithm and having it spit out a classification. And, you know, the same thing with, with a statistical model. We have to be a little bit more rigorous in how we evaluate and identify these effects. So that's all I have. I, and this was a very um, sort of seat of the pants lecture. But I hope it like brought up some issues that we might talk about further probably offline because we have like 10 minutes left. Let's go to the chat and see what we have here. Um, all right, Dick lost his connection. He got back in. Oswald uh, provided his email. He wants pay, uh, access to Gordon and Hirsch. And look for the email. So that's any other questions that people have about this? Okay, the fourth slide. Okay, yeah, that's good, Jesse. I'll put the slides in Slack. Let's go back to slide four. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen, actually. I'll have to do that first. Okay, here's four, uh, slide four. I don't have it in present mode. So you can see it better. Okay. If people have other questions, you can put them in the chat or just talk about them. <laughs> we have some more comments here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Dick said, hysteresis occurs in phase transitions. A connection here with Wolfram. Yeah, I'm sure that they, like, they talked about, I mean, the, the whole, there are a lot of things I didn't mention about those figures. I'm, I'm sure that was probably connected to something called a phase transition. Um, and then, can you repeat on how you compared both the workings? What does that mean? Um, Dick, the presumption that the brain starts with pixels is what I'm contesting. Is this like a con like? Oh, I wouldn't argue that the brain starts with pixels. Yeah, it's it's not it's not anywhere near. Yeah, <laughs> that's not really a fair characterization. But it's so there's always this analogy between 
of computer vision and, and natural vision. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, like in computer vision, we don't even really necessarily have to start with pixels. So, Vinay, I didn't know what you meant by repeat how you compared both the workings. Okay. Oh, Dicker. Oh, I thought you were saying something. You're muted. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, we have some more comments. I was intrigued when you said we can extract the V1 image look like by applying neuroimaging techniques. Yeah, so I can uh, send some references out on that. Uh, so people are doing like this work with uh, basically taking fMRI data, and which is not really a drug measurement of brain activity, but it's like a hemodynamic view of the brain. It, the the point is is that uh, you know they can take like the information that's in V1 and decode it and, you know, take like, you know, use a, an algorithm to sort of figure out what the source image is. And they're not able to actually get it directly. I mean, it's a little bit off, but they're able to get something that's approximating it. I can send some papers out on that and see what people think, because I mean, it, it's pretty controversial still in terms of like, you know, if, well, I mean, they're obviously constructing something because there's information there, but, it, it does seem to me like there are a lot of layers that were that they're working through, uh, but I'll send out some papers on that. Um, and then Dick says foveal detectors are an example of an alternative to array of pixels. Yeah, and so you have uh, like receptive fields and other types of detectors that can be used. As uh, a as like a sort of a a building block for inputs. Uh, I was using pixels just as a very simple example. Uh, yes, pontalism. So we talked last week. We talked about pontalism, which was an alternative to pixels. So last week, Dick presented on like CT imaging, and he talked about how people in the impressionist movement of the 19th century, some of them used a technique called pontalism, which is putting dots. On, on a you know on a canvas and then building images from that. Um, let's see. Okay, yes. Vinay says yes, thank you. And then Ujwal, uh Moreover, some of the biometrics also use an array of pixels. So I mean, yeah, pixel is you know, it's a it's a concept that's basically comes from back when they were building uh, you know computer graphics out of you know your screen at a certain number of discrete locations and then you would put dots in those locations and then those were the pixels and we kind of moved to where images had were made of pixels but those aren't like those aren't necessarily the most useful elements in a visual scene and the eye doesn't necessarily do it that way and you know we don't have to do it that way in computer vision um, so anyways, I'll send those slides out and we can talk about them. I just wanted to cover this paper in the last maybe five minutes. Um, and then we can, um, that'll be the top of the hour. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit. This was sent by um, Susan, who's uh, someone who is in the Diva Worm group uh, off and on, but she was interested in coming to the meeting. She sent this paper and it's actually on, uh, I'm sh still sharing my screen, so you should be able to see this paper. Uh, it's a science. It's in science, it's about uh, mouse blastocyst, which is in the embryo of the mouse, or it's a, a stage in the embryo of the mouse, and it's uh, something called hydraulic fracturing and active coarsening. Uh, so, the hydraulic fracturing is something they use to extract. Um, like natural gas out of shale where they use water to push stuff in and out of the uh, 
out of the rock. And so hydraulic fracturing in this case is being used as a metaphor for sort of a hydrodynamic process that works in the embryo to, uh, you know, shape sort of the structure, overall structure of the embryo. So they're using this uh, metaphor, fluid-filled lumen, which is uh, where all this happens, uh, breaks the radial symmetry of the blastocyst. So for a lot of you who aren't like familiar with development, and we can maybe talk about this paper in more detail next week, but uh, basically the embryo is a series of cells, and you have these uh, this basically this water pressure that's being used to sh sculpt how these uh, cells are, you know, how their shape, the shape that they take in the, in the embryo. And so the blastocyst cell, which is this little uh, clump of cells here, forms by swallowing a discharge of microlumens. So it's like something that happens within the cell and at the cell membrane. And so this is happening in different cells and they're moving around and forming these structures. Um, and let's see what else do they have in here. Uh, hydraulic fracturing could be directed by cell adhesion. So these cells are being, you know, moving against one another through different means. Uh, and they're proposing that it's a hydrodynamic sort of process. Okay, let me see what the comment is. I'm probably not doing this paper justice right now, but blastocele. Blastocele is pronounced blastocele. Yeah, I don't know. I've always pronounced the blastocele. No one's ever corrected me, so. Um, okay, so I mean, that's that's the paper. Uh, we'll talk about it next week. Um, maybe Susan can come and present. Have you seen this paper before, Dick? I'm just curious. Okay. Well... It, it, maybe she can present it next week. I'm just kind of going over it really quickly, but we can do a longer presentation on it. There's a lot in the paper. So, well, next week we're going to have, uh, and we're at the top of the hour, so I want to end the meeting, but uh, next week we're going to have a talk on um, hierarchical temporal modeling, and then maybe we can do a presentation on this more, in more detail. And then maybe there are some other things that people want to bring up. Next week is our last meeting of the year. So on the new year, we'll be doing some, maybe we'll be continuing with this. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, but if anyone has anything they'd like to share, we can schedule it or, you know, share the papers or whatever. So I encourage people to, to reach out and, and present different things and talk about them. We don't, we're not really that formal about it. Um, what day in January do we resume? Probably like within the first two weeks of the year. I think probably maybe even the first week. It depends on uh, what people's schedules are. Um, we'll probably have like a normal Devo or meeting when we don't have this. So we'll be, I wanted to give people an opportunity to participate in both. I have people who are, uh, did Yash share his email? I wanted to make sure he was on the mailing list. I want to see if he's up. Yeah, I did see it up there. I'm just writing it down. So I have a mailing list of people, and I want to keep mailing everyone on the mailing list who might be interested. And, uh, well, thank you for attending. And if there's no other uh, business, we can... Uh, Meet, we'll meet next week. Uh, if, if you need to contact me during the week, uh, contact me via Slack or by email. And I uh, hope to see everyone next week. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye.